the chick kind more like the people in the world seeking perspectives with it welcome back to a special episode of hard knock life we're episode 036 uh i have a very special guest joining me today uh she's the director of a brand new film that is currently available on netflix and actually just screened um in, in a few select cities uh last weekend uh, the movie is called Advantageous. It stars Jacqueline Kim as a single mother named Gwen Co. in the very near future or distant future. I don't know. It's very near future. We'll we'll talk a little bit about it. But I'm I'm lucky to have the uh, writer, co-writer, and director of the film, Jennifer Pong, joining us from the Bay Area. I'm assuming. That's right. I'm in San Francisco, Chinatown. Uh, how you doing, Jennifer? Thank you for being on the Nerds of Color. Happy to be here. Thanks, Keith. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on um, the success and the praise that Advantageous has been receiving. Um, I've been reading many of the reviews online from everything from Wire to io9. I think Manola Dar just reviewed it recently. Um, what, what, has, what has been your reaction to the reaction of the movie, just as we start? I am just blown away by um, the sheer volume of um, attention we've suddenly been receiving and I'm very happy. Uh, and I'm, I'm particularly excited because the film had a lot of um, influences coming in. You know, we, we did want to make a film, you know, about what women go through and what parents go through. Um, but we also, you know, we're excited to make science fiction films. Um, I'm actually with a company called Good Neighbor Media, Good Neighbors Media. And uh, Robert and I are kind of intent on, on making films about the future of women. And so, um, you know, we have a, you know, a desire to kind of expand the portrayal of women and, and the perspective of women. But, but, but the film's been resonating on a few levels, especially like we've also been getting, you know, Salon, you know, Arthur Chiu at, at Salon, and also um, some people at Al Jazeera are tapping into the, the, the subject of, you know, the economic crisis or, right. or the, the millennial problem of getting jobs as a millennial. So it's really interesting and and, and unexpectedly it's been getting a lot of um, attention. And then our Business Insider uh, article was about, you know, Coke saying it's like a better, the better, the best sci-fi film of the year, it's the best sci-fi film of the year, which I think is an amazing thing to say. Um, and I think it's very much from the perspective of it's, it's being kind of a needy film that's right. really trying to, to think, so. Well, before uh, before we dive into the, the themes of the movie, and I, I, did, I definitely want to talk about a lot of those themes that, that you were that you were just mentioning. Uh, can we give a step back a little bit and give a little bit of a history of the film and where it came from? Because uh, although it's a, this is a feature length film um, that's that's you know like I said currently available on Netflix and uh, in select cities, it, it actually started out several years ago or a couple years ago as as a short film for uh, the PBS digital uh, anthology series Future States. Can you talk a little bit about uh, one, can you first give a quick like elevator pitch of what the movie is about and then how it evolved from being this 20 minute short film to being a feature length uh, film? Sure, Advantageous is a, a short sci-fi film about a mother and daughter living in the near future. And the mom, her, her name is Gwen Ko, she's played by Jacqueline Kim. Uh, she has to uh, make this kind of decision about whether or not she wants to employ this technology that will allow her to move herself into a new body so she can keep her job. It's like a younger body, um, and and so the film uh, looks at the choices that women have to make in the near future. Um, when talk, interesting new forms of technology are available. Right. Um, yeah, and as far as the future states short goes, uh, we I was uh, I was approached after my my first feature, Half Life, to submit something, some sort of proposal for uh, a sh short a short that would look at you know a domestic kind of topic like what would happen and what, what could happen in the united states and, and they wanted it to definitely be you know exploring some things of relevance um and i had i submitted one quick proposal about mind jump like consciousness jumping into other bodies but it was um, based out of kind of a you know the sex trafficking industry mm -hmm. and and i think they were they realized that they didn't want to go to they didn't want to go there yet <laughs> um so they uh they asked me to submit something else and so i quickly kind of fused all um all my ideas into into advantageous and i'd been living in new york city at the time i'd been um you know traveling the subways and seeing a lot of different ways that parents raise their kids with a lot of energy and and, and focus and, and every single kid and, and parent wants wants it wants to thrive 
um, and to see the different this disparity in opportunities uh, for different kids in different parts of the city really is a big inspiration. Um, right. but then it, and it also reminded me of my mom and growing me growing up with my mom when, she, when my father had to be away in Malaysia. And so she was here on her own. And I really started to appreciate her working double shifts and focusing so much on my education and just going and, and just doing everything. Every, every moment of her life was about me. Right. I truly understood that after, after living on my own in New York and seeing other mothers and their kids so much. And then, and Jacqueline was was uh, featured in the short film, and and she's and she's of course the star of, of the feature length film. Uh, was her she's a she's also credited as a co writer for the feature film. Was she uh, involved in that capacity for the short film, or did that happen after uh, during that evolution process between the short and the feature? She became officially a writer for the feature film, but of course, you know the reason that I invited her uh, to to get involved is because she was. She's just bursting with creativity, and she's she's a consummate artist, and she's like an explosive explosion of ideas. Um, that's that's just who she is, and, mm -hmm. and she's 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 a brilliant, she's a genius. And and when um, we started getting involved um, together on the short film, she just we were just digging into everything, and you know I there were there are a lot of parts of Gwen that came out of me asking Jacqueline, you know, what her her strengths were in terms of language and art. Um, and so we built the story around her strengths, and um, and she has a, a lot of strengths. So, um, so it was almost about like, okay, which strengths we don't include, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like and, the, the the ability to speak French was was that just because Jacqueline can 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 rock out in, in some in some French, and so you're like, we're going to make Gwen speak French because of that. I wanted some other language, and so it was. I was like, what languages can you speak really well? Um, Korean and French, you know, English. You know? <laughs> so so uh, we didn't do Korean because. Korean was an option, but we didn't do Korean because it felt like I wanted something that was was taking the other side of the globe, right. you know, the other hemisphere into account um, for her, her character and her, her marketing reach. So I was imagining that Gwen would go to France to market. Well, you know, let's 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 talk about that a little bit because I think um, one of the interesting things about the film, you, you mentioned all of the themes uh, that, that are tackled um, on the film. And, and one of them, although it's not, it's never overt, but you know, there is, there is a very uh, uh, interesting sense of how, how the film tackles race and identity. Um, you know, the, just it, it, the most radical thing being that it's a, it's a feature length film starring Asian Americans playing, playing regular normal people well, as normal as possible in, in the, in the near future that you've, that you've imagined. But that in and of itself is pretty, it's a pretty radical notion, you know, for better or worse. Um, but, uh, but also the fact that, like you said, that, uh, you know, you, you, you have Jacqueline speaking French and there, there's all of the, all of these, uh, you know, there there aren't a lot of like signifiers necessarily that like this is an Asian immigrant story or anything like that. That's kind of like the tropes whenever you see Asian American films. Uh, was that a conscious decision to make to make their their race and their identity kind of uh, part of the fabric of the film without being like you know the we're gonna put a megaphone on it and say these are Asian people. Yeah, it's always been always been my uh, ex that's always been my thing. Um, ever since I started making films with Asian Americans. Um, I felt like I, I don't know, for whatever reason, it, it just seemed to make sense that we had stories that were just as important as everyone else's stories. Um, and the idea of normalizing an Asian American female in her you know, late 30s, 40s, you know, that seemed like a good idea. Um, and, and something that was necessary right now. Um, so, uh, yeah. I, and the thing is, you know, while it's a science fiction story, you know, I did want to make it true to life in a way. And, you know, the story that Gwen's going through is, you know, so many women, mothers of all races are connecting with it because it's, it's and parents of all races are connecting with it because it's truly about what a parent, parent thinks about all the time. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, and as a parent, you can't you can't help but think about like the, the sacrifices that you're willing to, to, to go through for the for for the sake of your children. But but on this notion of race, one of the one of the plot twists or one of the uh, uh, story story twists in the film is is the is the is the idea that you mentioned earlier about Gwen transferring her consciousness into a different body, into a younger body. Um, and 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 one of the you know interesting things about watching the movie kind of in this post. Rachel Dolezal post Emma Stone 
uh, environment. The, it's, the, it's the notion that, uh, uh, you know, the Jacqueline Kim character has her consciousness not only transferred to um, uh, a younger body, but and for all intents and purposes, uh, a different ethnically, uh, a, a, diff a different ethnicity. Um, although the actress who plays uh, Gwen 2.0, Freya Adams, I think is her mm -hmm. name. That's um, right. she, she's kind of a quote unquote, like racially ambiguous, but she's clearly not, you know, Korean American like Jacqueline is. Um, was, that, was it a conscious decision to not make her like, to not, you know, basically to not cast Emma Stone as that character? Um, there was some talk between um, so when we were making the short film, you know, Moon Molson, who was my producer for the short, and also came onto the feature. You know, we talked about you know whether she should be you know blonde, uh, Caucasian American, or and I think I was really excited about making sure it was ambiguous for a lot of reasons. You know, I'm an yeah. I'm an anime fan too, so um, there's this idea that there's <laughs> there's this ideal anime female that uh that has <laughs> many features that all everyone loves and can connect to right right and even in korea uh, when i was in uh taking my film half-life through the the korean Amer uh, the korean women's festival um some of my hosts talked about how Jess jessica alba was this ideal for most women that they, they wanted to achieve right. um and so you know so i was looking at you know okay it doesn't necessarily i think it's I was looking at what could be people looking at, at at race as a possible like kind of flavor of the month or a fashionable mm -hmm. moment, and and I think maybe the safe bet from a corporate perspective in the future could be something that felt ambiguous. Right. Um, everyone could access. Well, and and I think that you know that's definitely it comes through in the film, especially the the, the notion you know, and again it's. It, the message isn't necessarily overt to the, this idea, you know, about like uh, having a different, you know, uh, racial makeup to be, to be, you know, your defining trait. But, but I think th what, what I find really interesting about the film is the, all of those subtleties are there, right? Like the reason Gwen loses her job is, is there's, there's ageism and there's, you know, a, a, a tint of potentially racism. Like there, there are all of these isms that are part of it, but, but they're not necessarily, you know, front and center. And, and I think, that was that was kind of the what you were going for as far as that that narrative throughout the film. Sure. Um, yeah. I you know and I think most no one wants to be considered a racist and and even in the world of you know making money, it's not good business to be racist. It's good business to be um, you know open minded and and embracing of as many people as possible to get as much money as possible. So. You know, that, that's, I, I, and I don't think, I don't necessarily people think that people who make the decisions, decisions aren't racist. They, they may not be racist. They may just be really like self-preservational right. and, and survivalist. And, or and, oblivious in some cases. Or oblivious, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, worse, it's almost worse when it's a survivalist choice. Though. That's, what, that's what the films are kind of really digging into. You know? Right, right. And I think that the, that's another, another kind of theme that the film touches on a lot, too, is, is like notions of class and, and socioeconomics and um you know in, in this in this future state that you've that you've imagined that you know it's it you know in, in one sense you know when you watch the movie you almost don't feel like it's set in the future until you do those you know epic pans of like the the um cityscapes and then you realize oh, and this is the future because a lot of the conversations that are happening are pretty close to the things that are happening nowadays, right? As far as like that divide between, um, you know, the the elite and, you know, there's like the sh the middle class being evaporated, and and it's either you you're in these you know prestigious schools or you're just you know left to wallow in the streets, and we're not that far from it now in 2015, um, you know. When when you talk about those issues, especially all of the all of the the story points around. Um, the daughter getting into that prestigious school. What what was the what was the impetus for 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 those for those aspects of the film? What what inspired you or influenced you to write those pieces about addressing you know the socioeconomic kind of where we're headed as a society uh, if we if we um, don't change our ways? I guess there were a few things. Um, I had a lot of friends who are parents and. And they talked about become, when they talk about becoming like a mother or a father. In this, in this case, I was talking to a father. Um, he talked about how 
he would be willing to take a, a bullet for his kid. And every decision he was making had to be about his kid's future. So when you, when you kind of follow that line of thinking, you also look at every single family in America and you look at where our country's going or can be, could go. And you realize that if all we're doing is protecting our kids individually and not as a community, mm -hmm. that it could actually and often does lead to a place we don't, a world we don't want to live in. Um, right. Because if, if you're, if everyone's like a, a clan, every family is a clan, then, and, and you yes, you're trying to create alliances and people create alliances, but it's not this kind of holistic understanding that you, even by like making an alliance of, between classes like rich versus poor, we, we do, we will have a problem. Right. We don't want, we don't want this, this idea that, that we have to continuously ex exploit uh, people who are weak um, if we do that. So it's like, it's not just, I mean, it's not so much anxiety, but more just like a kind of an, uh, just kind of seeing how the cause and effect of everything. And, and again, like living in San Francisco and living in New York, you're constantly exposed to people who are in trouble. Um, right. And it, and you know, and you, I know, I feel like as much as we try to embrace the idea that life is unfair, um, we don't have to accept, we, we shouldn't tr accept it because I think it's, it's almost self-defeatist. Mm -hmm. it, it also is not in anyone's interest. Um, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm not really, I know I, it's, it's hard to say I'm not trying to preach, but at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, you know, that's what inspired me was this sense that, you know, things aren't, there, there's just some, there's some not, people are just not thinking this through. Yeah. Right. Um, and 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 again, just just to just to be clear, that the film itself does not come off didactic at all in that sense. But yeah. the, but the but the touches of, you know, just the 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 um, juxtaposition of like the some of the opulence and some of that technology, and some of like the you know the purposeful decisions to show like these gleaming almost sterile city streets, and then like a homeless person, uh, a homeless little girl sleeping in a in a um, like a little, little planter garden or something like that. Just the kind of contrast of that, I, I just found very powerful, and but also very, very close to where where we are. That this doesn't, you know, a lot of times movies about the future are about these like dystopian futures and you know post apocalyptic futures where like oh, everything's going to hell. But like what I kind of appreciated about the film is that it shows like the, you know. And again, it, the film itself is not just, I, I don't think, I wouldn't necessarily even categorize it those kind of like dystopian films. Like mm -hmm. there, there's a lot, there's actually a, a, a sense of, you know, it's not, there's, it's not like a sense of foreboding. There's also, there's some kind of, there's some hope in the film as well, but, uh, and, and the, the way that the, 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 the love between the, the mother and daughter is very, is very moving and powerful, but just the, the ideas of seeing like the edges, seeing the stuff on the edges where, where you're seeing like, the potential for this society to kind of fall into that like dystopian world. I mean, cause there are also explosions and, and, and stuff like that, but they're on the background. And that's another kind of like interesting, interesting touch that I thought that you kept the kind of like sci-fi tropes in kind of like on the, on the perimeter. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, yeah it, it, it seemed to make sense that not just for, for the scale of the film and for the, the focus on the, the mother daughter relationship, it made sense that, you know all the the gadgets and um, drones and explosions would just be kind of something they noticed in life. Um, I think, I mean, in a way, that's also trying to be true to life because so many people just try to focus on survival and almost try to keep all these really scary things that are happening in the world at the edges of their consciousness in order to uh, survive to get through the next to get through the day. And um, yeah, there's a lot of there are a lot of moments where Gwen sees something and then just kind of lets it go. And Jules the same, and Jules, Jules is the same thing. Right. Um, but then at some point, Gwen, you know, Gwen engages it, and I think she's always kind of seeing. I think, you know, really what it is is that like things like the explosions and and the the, the women who are in trouble, those are those are reminders of what could happen um, mm -hmm. to her and Jules, and so. Um, it's supposed to kind of help build the world that they're trying to survive in. And it also, it, it provides that motivation for Gwen, right? To really like, if I don't provide these opportunities, if I don't get 
the money that's necessary to get Jules into this, into the school that will, or the camp or the schools that will, that will guarantee her, you know, success in life. This is a potential outcome, and that motivates Gwen to to do that ultimate sacrifice that she ends up having to choose. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Spoiler alert. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, you know, people are finding that they have to watch it sometimes more than once to, to get all of that. Um, some people are just really, I'm very, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a viewer who has to watch things more than once because I'm, I'm, in, I'm digesting things on, on different levels, you know, first time, second time. So, no, I think this is actually helpful. And some of the people are saying it's helpful to watch the short film even before watching the, the feature because then it becomes like an expansion. Um, and right. Well, yeah. I was actually going to ask about that because I know that if anyone who's seen both, if you've seen if you've seen the the short film, you you realize that there are a lot of scenes that you know that echo the short film. They're almost that seem that seem to be lifted straight out of the short. Mm -hmm. um, but what what's what's kind of brilliant is that the 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 feature film kind of you know it expands on it because it's it's much longer for one, <laughs> but it also adds it adds layers by adding you know char new characters. Um, Kind of more motivations, more backgrounds. The where, where the where the short film made it definitely it's got that haunting, the same haunting tone, but it provides more more exposition, more background. One of the one of those background characters that are that's new to the new to the feature length film and 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 was absent from the short is the presence of Ken Jeong's character, and he's 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 a, he has a very small part in the film, but he he was he was uh, one I think Im important in terms of getting the film. The feature film made, and I think Jacqueline had a had 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 an insight into getting him onto the film. And two, I think what anyone who's a fan of Ken Jeong will be will be pleasantly surprised by his performance because I think it's unlike any performance he's ever delivered on screen. It, it is, and uh, it is his first dramatic role, and I think that was why he was interested. Not, I mean, there were there were two reasons he was interested. One, he loved the short film. He's a father of two twin girls, and his wife. Uh, Tran also connected with the short film, and he's a, um, he's a really smart guy, <laughs> and uh, and he, he helped on, on a lot of levels. Yeah, he helped um, get the film made, but he also um, brought his insight as a father and uh, and as a, a viewer, and uh, and he was just extremely wonderful to have on on set because it helped the crew get through a really long day. Um, you know, be between our really emotional scenes where he's crying or screaming, you know, where people are here, you know, he would just stop and like make everyone laugh for five minutes, you know, as we were setting up the next, uh, the next, uh, the lighting setup, camera setup. So, uh, yeah, he was awesome to work with and, um, and yeah, I'm actually really excited. He's having a new show coming, coming on, um, Dr. Ken, which right, is right. hilarious. So, yeah, he's 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 a, he's a, he's he's definitely uh, he's having a moment, but um, but no, I was I was I was really you know uh, taken aback actually by his by his performance because I mean for for one you know as 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 funny as a great guy Ken Jeong is sometimes the characters that he's played in, in past movies have been difficult for people to kind of accept. I mean I say this only as someone who's also named Mr. Chow and it was <laughs> imagine. <laughs> Imagine being a high school English teacher during the the period of the Hangover. Uh, that wasn't wasn't fun time. So, uh, but but it's kind of it's great to see him kind of like how be kind of reserved and 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 not just that he's playing dramatic, but he's but there are a lot of nuances to his character. And I and I've read that um, it was his role in the Hangover. Oddly enough, is what attracted you and Jacqueline and made you think that he might be good for the part. Is that true? Jacqueline definitely um, had seen. Jacqueline had seen, you know, I don't know what Jacqueline's doing watching The Hangover, um, but, but she, she said that behind his dark sunglasses, she could see this moment of this, like this decision or it's just that was much more complex uh, a choice than most people would even notice. And, and so she goes, you know, I think he's a really good actor. And I did, okay. I mean, he makes me laugh. Mm -hmm. um, so he must be a really smart actor. Uh, and so you know, we talked to uh, my agent, Andrew uh, Rogers, about you know, him, and he was excited about, like, sending him the script. <laughs> and so, uh, thank God he liked the film. Thank God, he, you know, it was, and it was really good. He, he came out for three days, four days to New York, and we got an extra rain day so we could rehearse another day, um, which I thought would be, was good just because it, it helped, you know, Jacqueline and Jennifer Akeda, 
who plays Lily and, mm -hmm. and Ken just have a, a longer longer history together, you know, because that's a really hard thing to do is when you just like meet someone, you know, and then suddenly you're, you're playing as if you've been, you know, long friends for 10, 15 years. You know, that takes some pretty sophisticated people, you know, a group of, some talent there to, to bring that together. And I mean, they just, they work beautifully together. Yeah. Uh, another character that that's um, new to the film, another actor is, is Jennifer Eel. And, and the, the the film, if, and it, it's, it's a science fiction film that kind of lacks a villain, but if, I guess if anyone had to be positioned as the antagonist, it would probably be her character. Uh, how did you get her onto the film? And, and where, did, where did the idea for her character come from since it was newly you know, created between the, the short and the, um, and the feature wing? Yeah, I really must credit Jacqueline for, um, for inventing the crier, <laughs> is a crier, um, the character of is a crier. Um, Jack, we, we thought that we should have Gwen connect with the the board or the you know powers that be that are behind you know James Urbaniak's character. So James Urbaniak is our direct supervisor, but he has to um, he talks mm -hmm. about the board. So who's the board? And um, Jacqueline said, you know, what if it's a woman? You know, and and I was like, no, yes, no, yes, <laughs> um, and. And it was a brilliant idea because it reminded both of us, and Jacqueline says it, this a lot on Q&As, that you know, sometimes women are the, are the hardest on each other um, for whatever reason. And I actually just was started watching Black Mirror and a lot because a lot of people have been com comparing Advantageous to Black Mirror. Right. And and there's actually a reference there's, uh, to this very subject in, in the second um, episode of Black Mirror where a woman both empathizes but also has to kind of play along with the corporate agenda of, of this game show. Um, so Jennifer Ely was this perfect, I'd, I'd seen her in, I'd seen Jennifer Ely in Contagion mm -hmm. and, um, and the moment, and every little, every little thing she did in Contagion blew me away and I hadn't really known of her before. Um, and I, I said, this, this actress is brilliant. This actress is doing something crazy that's completely uncalled for and perfect for, for <laughs> Contagion. And then I saw her again in, in Zero Dark Thirty. Right. And, and, and she was definitely the first person we thought of. Uh, so, so you shot the film. The I know the the short was shot in New York, but you also you came back to New York to shoot the uh, the shoot the, the feature. Yes, our producers for the feature were also based out of New York, and so it was like I, I felt like I had to build the production around our strengths on the production side. And since um, both Teresa Nararo and um, Robert Chang were based in Brooklyn and in Manhattan, and it. it it made sense. Plus, you know, Samantha Kim, who plays Jules, was based out of New Jersey. So, mm -hmm. um, so really, this, I mean, it wouldn't, it would have been difficult to have in, in every which way, you know, to do a shoot in LA, shoot in San Francisco, shoot in New York. Someone would have to be flying. A lot of people would have to be flying. So we ended up just bringing out uh, like at least five to 10 people from the San Francisco Bay Area to New York, and um, including my DP, Richard Wong, who had, who had, uh, I'd met um, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of logistics. So yeah, yeah. well, and um, Ther Teresa has a, Teresa Navarro, who's one of the producers, has a great uh, brief cameo in the film. She's she plays one of the uh, um, like the the table of like weird, <laughs> almost step forty in um, uh, moms who are who are trying to convince. Uh, uh, Jacqueline's character to to attend their camp. It's, it's a really it's a really haunting scene, and, and she has a great cameo there. Um, yeah. I did want to I did want to mention Samantha uh, as well because I think you know anytime you you do a film and and you have to cast a young young actor, um, you know she as much as Jacqueline carries the film, I think Samantha carries the other half of the film because she's she's the she's the like I said earlier she's the motivation for Gwen. Jules is. Um, you know, she has to be smart. She has to be nurturing. She has to play the daughter to you know, and, and some of the some of the acting choices she makes when when you know her new mom shows up is are, are just brilliant. She's the same. It's the same um, little girl from the from the short film, right? That's right. Yes. How, how <laughs> did you luck into casting uh, casting her? Because this is this was her was this her first acting gig? Yes, um, this was her first film. Uh, so. My friend Keisuke Huashi is also an actor. Um, he's a Japanese American actor. Um, he's been on Mad Men, but he he also was running um, a camp for 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 young people interested in you know music, dance, and film. 
And I asked him if he knew of anyone um, who was just brilliant, like just any genius, you know, 11 <laughs> to 12 year old female Asian actors, you know, and he said, yes, Samantha Kim. And, and that was it. Uh, so, so basically, you know, we had, um, Anne Tuchel was our casting director uh, for the short film and she brought in Sam and also Freya Adams. Um, and, and basically, you know, we just met one, one and a half times and it was clear that she had a, a really profound emotional intelligence, um, both Freya and Samantha. Um, and Samantha, and Samantha, as she, you know, she was definitely hitting her growth spurt. So that's why we had to race to shoot the, the feature. Um, but what was cool was that she was getting slightly older and therefore could handle more complex dialogue and understand the idea of like a, a really advanced precociousness of a future girl. Um, and then understand the complexity of kind of embracing a new, new mom and, um, and just, yeah, she just had moments of, of magic um, like that I was just really happy with. And um, yeah, she's also a beautiful dancer. Uh, I got to see some of her, her videos while she was just like, her schedule was packed. So we had to make sure we shot during the summer when she wasn't at school because she's like about to be a junior now. Um, and so she, between dancing, her dance team and her, and her AP classes and, uh, you know, we had to make sure we just got her right at the right time. She's sounds in like, she sounds like Jules in real life, almost. Uh, absolutely. She totally identifies with the character, as does her mom. And um, But they have a father in their life, and he's just an amazing dad. And, um, yeah. so, and she, has two, uh, she has two siblings as well, one of which plays one of her step-siblings. Uh, his name is Joshua. Joshua uh, uh, plays her steps like the little kid that ends up in the picnic at the, you know. Right, right, right. I can't spoil everything. <laughs> yeah. uh, earlier, you uh, you, had, you had mentioned um, in some of the write ups about about the film that it, the, that it's been labeled a deeply feminist film, and I know that you know, that's a that's a a term that's that's taken on a lot of different meanings, especially in the age of the you know internet and social media. There's 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 the you know it used to be like people used to throw around derogatory. Uh, used to throw the term around as if it was a derogatory term and now i think that a lot of people are embracing the notion of feminism and, and especially how it relates to 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 genres like this um, um you know we were on the heels of, of mad max fury road and, and there was a lot of talk about how deeply feminist that film is but i think that you know this this film even though there is no there you know there isn't a uh, you know imperiosa furiosa imperator furiosa uh there's i think jacqueline's character of, of gwen is is also there, there's a lot of um deep themes of feminism in, in the film too even though that it, it doesn't necessarily show the badass like sarah connor like how, how how do you like define the film in those terms and, and what what do you think makes us feminist science fiction film hmm. Oh, such a great question. Um, and and yes, I, I was very sensitive to the to the idea that the fe feminism was a kind of pejorative word, you know, for the last ten years. And I got super lucky that it stopped being a pejorative word. This year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I keep saying thank you, Beyonce. Thank you, Taylor <laughs> Swift. Oh my gosh, you saved us. Um, but uh, and also, you know, in talking to a lot of journalists who are female. You know, they're all, they, we're all realizing that we're all out there. We're all kind of going, oh yeah, women should be equal. Yeah, we should, mm -hmm. be, we should have an equal voice. Why? Because they're half the population and also we're important. We just manage, you know, for many, many, many years, we've allowed ourselves and our value to be defined by something else. It isn't necessarily defined by, by men, but it might be a market that was driven by men and fixated on pleasing, you know, males between the ages of 14 and 34, I'm just right. using numbers, but, sure, sure. But, but women actually have money now, <laughs> so <laughs> they can also define the market, um, and that's what's exciting. Um, one of the, one of the, you know, benefits of living in, like you said, the era today where, where, where there's, I think a more honest discussion about feminism is the, is especially in kind of like, a, you know, in the context of something like science fiction, where, where the notion of like, being being a, a feminist heroine in a in a science fiction film, the the um, the archetype is like like I said, Sarah Connor or Ripley from Alien or or uh, or the Charlie Theron character from Mad Max. But what what I think is what I find you know kind of interesting about putting advantageous in that kind of uh, 
context is the fact that it's it it's deeply feminist but it's also feminine in the sense that it's about motherhood and it's about um you know because sometimes there is there is definitely there's a thin line between between you know what's feminist and what's feminine right does that make sense because i know that like for example with uh with like the black widow character in the avengers movie uh joss whedon uh had there was a lot of controversy about her sterility and that making her seem like less than human and 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 notions about like so you know like i was saying earlier like the the only the only way you can butt up against that stereotype is to be like a badass you know action heroine but can you be you know a mother and 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 feminine and and, and things and some of the questions that you deal with that you wrestle with in the film and still be feminist yeah yeah definitely uh definitely great great um exploration here uh, I mean, I think that the film is considered feminist because it's it has a it has a it's looking deeply at the problems or challenges facing women in a society that tells women what their value is and um, and and there you know I think a lot of women attempt to be I, I keep saying you know one of the problems of growing up in the Western world, or actually in the, the entire world um, <laughs> as a woman, is that somehow you're, every, both women, men and women are, defined, are told how, what their value is by, this, by society. Right. But women are told more often than not that, they're, that they have to be perfect in these six ways. And men have about four ways. Women have six to 12 ways that they have <laughs> to be perfect, you know? And, it, and while, Part, part of the imperative of being a man in our society is to protect our women. Part of the imperative of a woman is to be, of a woman being in society is to be the best mother, daughter, you know, sex object, uh, and now, you know, entre entrepreneur, you know, it, you have it all, right? Have it all, be it all. Um, and that sounds great. And I would love that like automatically, who wouldn't love it, but at the same time, it, it puts, it just destroys so many people, it just so many women just waste about half of their life trying to be perfect in every possible way. I, I know I spent, I wasted some of my, at least a few years trying to be perfect in every way. Um, because then you just lose time, you lose your, you lose your brain cells, you lose, you're not reading, instead you're dieting, you know? You're, right, right, you're right, shopping right. instead of researching, uh, you know? You're dating because you also want to marry the perfect man because you're trying to be romantic. You want to find that happiness because that idea, that romantic ideal of like Prince Charming, is, has been indoctrinated in you from, you know, age ten. So, yeah, it's a, it's a. So anyway, that's the from feminist perspective in the film. It's just to kind of explore our, having women explore their values and also women kind of surrender their strength when there's a backlash against feminism. Right. Um, and instead, but but they're so. But these women in this in this future are still savvy. So they're they're trying to work within that system that's been that is working for them. Um, but yeah, feminism doesn't necessarily mean Wonder Woman. Feminism doesn't necessarily mean I have to have a gun. So right. in a future where where people are violent against women, women are picking up guns. They have right, right, right. Uh, self defense. And I mean, I love Mad Max for a couple of reasons. One of it. One of the reasons was that it had a, a sense, it accuses men of destroying the world without saying so. It pretty much accuses the male, yeah. the masculine like right, energy right. for destroying the world. And I, I see them some truth in that, just some. Uh, but I also <laughs> love that there are these men who are equal partners in trying to team up with, with benevolent women the benevolent grandmothers and the benevolent and Furiosa who take try who are just trying their hardest to take care of each other. Right. And that's I think what advantages is in common, you know, with yep, yep. with with Mad Max is that there's a sense that there's something there's something to the feminine energy. It there it isn't like something that should be disrespected in any way. They are the people that nurture and grow things and, and the they, they nurture and grow things that we all enjoy. Right. And, and and actually make life worth living. Right. Um, so, yeah, feminism can be a lot of things, and it can also include like the value of feminine values. You know, yeah. the feminine values. Well, and I and I think you know you know um, the, the the your film advantageous kind of definitely explores that, and, and even making the um, um, uh, 
Fisher, James and Bernie Urbaniak's character, the Fisher. Yeah. Yes. But, you know, he's he's kind of he kind of is that you know he's he could have been he could have been set up as as the antagonist, like I said earlier. It's actually Jim Bailey's character, but right. um, you know he he's very sympathetic to to Gwen, and and there's there's definitely uh, there there he there's a caring between the two of them, and like those scenes on the pier, both with with Jacqueline and with uh, Frey are, are are some of the most moving scenes in the whole film, um, and and that and that's where you know a lot of the a lot of the revelations kind of come through. Um, just, just kind of like stepping back a little bit and just kind of exploring this idea of, of, of just science fiction as a genre that, that seems to be your kind of storytelling, um, or narrative, you know, uh, genre of choice. Is, is that, is that a fair assessment? Do you, do you feel that science fiction allows you to tell the kinds of stories you, you, you want to tell more so than other genres? Um, science fiction and fantasy are you know, dream genres for me because I get to create world s stuff, animation, you know, beautiful things. I get to create beautiful things. And that's, that's why I was interested in films to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, as I went through like my education, you know, I started to realize there was a, a dearth, there was a, there was a vacuum that needed to, to be filled uh, for, you know, women in, in diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that became part of my, so yeah, bringing those two together is more of a more of a dream job than that. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, doesn't mean that I can tell stories. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people would say that, like in film, like in series like Black Mirror, or in or in you know, most science fiction, there is a way to look at society more closely without um, making it super depressing <laughs> to, do, to look at. Uh, so, to, so there's a way to kind of enjoy the escapism of the, of the future world. Kind of like Blade Runner is another great example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also have us like become, you know, encourage a little bit more sympathy and empathy between people. Um, because if you look at a future world that's dystopian and you see hate and pain like in Mad Max, just total exploitation, we know, I think we know in our gut, we do not want that. And mm -hmm. we have to kind of keep an eye out you know, we have to look at ourselves and go, how do we make sure we, this, this world doesn't happen? How do we make sure that we don't um, let the world become just desert, no water, and with a few people taking, take, having all the resources? Right. You know, it's, a, it's important. And, well, you know, it's an important thing right now <laughs> to, uh, it's important to pay attention. <laughs> Are there any particular uh, science fiction films or stories that, or fantasy films or stories that, that, that you kind of cite as as influential, not necessarily for advantageous, but just in your you know because you, you mentioned those are the types types of genres that that inspired you to be a filmmaker. Are there are particular films you mentioned Blade Runner. Are there other films that that kind of fall into the you know this is what this is what Je what made Jennifer want to be a director? Uh, Blade Runner is definitely one of them. Um, science fiction films. I mean, Ghost, Ghost in the Shell, for sure. I mean, I, I'm not making, you know, Ghost in the Shell, but mm -hmm. like the, the animation, but I I think what's great about things like Ghost in the Shell and Neon Genesis Evangelion, these are, these are two of my big like, sci-fi anime um, right. loves that I've watched repeatedly. Um, Lost is good too, but I mean, there's a sophistication in the, I mean, in the, in the, in the anime that, mm -hmm. and also lots of Miyazaki, in right. fact, Miyazaki, while it's not science fiction all the time, it's, it's, it is. It's definitely sometimes. fantasy. It's definitely fantasy. And I guess you could say that Nausicaa is a little sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, they, yeah, there's a sensitivity. There's, I mean, especially in Miyazaki's films, that there's a sense that the community can work together, that having, an, having this idealism that carry you through life, is a, it can be a beautiful, magical thing. And... Mm -hmm. I mean, Miyazaki's work reminded me of you know who I wanted to be ever since I was a kid. You know, someone who just helped people, and also you know kind of was awesome sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was just trying. You know, I, I think I think it's every one person's fantasy to be fantasy to to be important. You know, but right. at the same time, you know, but for the right reasons. <laughs> so um, I think, and and you know, Neon Genesis allows for like domestic problems and it also takes into account you know 
the crisis of being a teenager and not having love between mother and daughter, or father and son, and how all of that kind of collapses into your place in the world and your and, and the world existing at all. And there's just all these crazy subconscious connections that that um, that these filmmakers have dared to explore. Um, and yeah, so those are some of my references, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all on the sci-fi side, but I have right. a lot of non-sci-fi like. Scorsese is a huge mm -hmm. influence, yeah, you know, um, on the dramatic side. Yeah. Sure, I mean, and you can, I mean, like I said, the, they don't necessarily influence the style or the tone of, of, of this particular film, but just kind of, you know, thinking of the genre in general, you know, and as a person of color, as a woman of color, um, and just thinking about that representation, they're, they're, why is it so difficult for for um, these kinds of signs? I mean, you meant you, you cited a lot of um, anime, so that that kind of, you know, uh, even even in that sense, like the, the anime stories you, you you cited are are you know, oftentimes when they're translated to the West, like so for example, you brought up Ghost in the Shell. Um, there's a there's a live action adaptation coming and, and scarring, uh, you know, Scarlett Johansson as the as the titular character. The, you know, why is it so difficult for for um, women of color, for people of color in general, just to to be parts of these? You know, because you know, as 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 the curator of the Nerds of Color, one of the things that we always get a lot of pushback from is that any attempts to diversify science fiction, fantasy, superheroes always gets met with a lot of um, uh, let's just say criticism. <laughs> from, so you're, you get the pushback from fans, or you get a pushback from who? Oh uh, no, well, well, some fans. Like so, for example, yeah. whenever um, so, like in in the superhero genres, as as you can see, there's a lot of superhero right. uh, paraphernalia in the room, uh, and, and and you know those characters all come from a from an era where where whiteness was the default, and mm -hmm. a lot of films who are trying to take steps to kind of uh, you know level the playing field by casting non white actors in those roles there's there's usually you know uh, a fury that explodes on the internet about that uh right. and then and then and in some cases you know studios uh who who are casting these films um uh they make it explicit spider-man must be white he must be straight or uh, um and then and then and oftentimes characters that are of are of color when they're cast in, in in films by studios you know whether it's avatar the last airbender or um, you know, as I said, Ghost in the Shell. Clearly, pe people of color in these science fiction fantasy uh, uh, stories, they get cast as white. So, like, there seems to be a, I wouldn't say a concerted effort, but there's definitely pushback from both the, the you know, the infrastructure of, of the Hollywood studio system, as well as a lot of fans who don't necessarily share uh, your or my or our kind of need for representation or diversity in, in these kinds of, in these particular kinds of stories, because a, a lot of times, uh, and Arthur Chu talks about this all the time, the, the, this, this notion that like social justice warriors are just ruining everything, you know what I mean? So like that's, that's, you know, that's kind of what I'm talking about as far as like what, what you know, cause a lot of, a lot of times, you know, I mean, this whole website was created because we love science fiction. We love fantasy. We love, we love these stories, but we also would like to see ourselves represented in these stories once, once in a while. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the solution comes with a fan base, um, I think. Um, so it means that, and, it's, and, I, and what's been working, what we were talking about is, as far as what's been working for, for women um, is, is, is being vocal about, you know, us being vocal about what we want, and that's what mm -hmm. you're doing. Um, and and when, there's, when you get this pushback, I mean, I'm just, I mean, uh, to be honest, like the pushback, it could, I, I'm going to try and not insult anybody, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but I can say the, the, the push, the, any pushback that we've been hearing, feeling for the last two months over anything that has to do with allowing for diversity, you know, in the media or anywhere or in our lives, you know, they're all in the same camp. You know, we don't want to be challenged. We don't, right. we don't, we want ourselves, they want themselves represented. And I, but at the same time, I think that men and women of color, girls and boys of color, have to be more brave um, in, mm -hmm. in kind of speaking out. Um, I remember when I was younger, being a, as, as a woman and as a woman of color, being needing, having, feeling alone, feeling like I had to be white, feeling like I had to not to downplay, um, you know, my race in some way. Um, mm -hmm. And 
I, I think that happens all, all across the business and, and more and more though, um, people in, in power are diversifying and that and normalizing. And so that's, that's a really good thing. And, and it's a great time to be brave, I think. Right. Um, cool. I mean, and I think, and you know, the thing about science fiction, which is, which is, which is kind of what draws, I think, you to it and draws me to it. And, and again, when I say science fiction, I mean kind of all speculative fiction, right? Whether it's sci-fi or fantasy or comic books or whatever. I think what we're, what, why we're drawn to it is that because you know these are these are worlds that that aren't real, they're, they're, but they are still reflections of what we know, and we still want to see uh, see our not only just see ourselves reflected in in these alternate worlds, but just to know that you know we exist and we aren't erased, right? And and I think it was Juno Diaz who made, you know, who, who and I'm, I'm not gonna quote him directly to talk, but he, he had mentioned something like, you know, these fans will, will like, you know, um, me, like learn the entire Klingon, you know, alphabet, but will chafe if they see Spanish in their like science fiction stories, right? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like this, this they'll, they'll speak Dothraki or Elvish, but like Spanish though, or, or like any other, real language they'll just, they'll just chafe at it and i think that's the that's the kind of you know that's the next step in the evolution of being a fan of color just it's just like i think i think you're, you're probably on the right to just ignore those people right don't even worry about them really really ignore them yeah just keep i mean i think what i what kept me what keeps me going is is finding working with people that you respect <laughs> and um and respecting yourself mm. and uh yeah, just keeping your eyes on like creating. If you if you feel like things need to be diversified, just support film, support media and comics that are diversified, and make your own. I mean, and yep. just, yeah, totally ignore. It. Make because because truly that that perspective to me is irrelevant. It is. Um, right. Yeah. Well, um, it's what's next down 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 the pike for you? I know that with Advantageous was just released on Netflix. It's 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 a huge success. Um, so congratulations well, on that. What's what's next for you after this? Um, so I'm, I'm so Robert and I are still together on, on Good Neighbors Media, our, our, our production company, and so we have two projects um, in the pipeline right now that are like in pre-pro. One of them is called Can the Canopy, the Stream, the Sea. And the other one is Look for Water, which, which is this adaptation of this play by um, Dominic Ma. Mm -hmm. Both of them involve um, female scientists. One of them is science fiction and the other one is like hard science. Um, the one that's hard science is about um, uh, rediscovering uh, hope through our current cynical climate, mm -hmm. uh, um, about climate. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's actually based on this real, uh, this woman who who is a climate scientist in Berkeley, and um, you know, trying trying to kind of, she, she's given up, and so she she like escapes into the Borneo rainforest, and and these tech entrepreneur, this tech entrepreneur like a Steve Jobs type tries to come and re inspire her. Um, so it's a lot, a little bit like before midnight, or you know, just mm. sensitive dialogue in in the jungle. Um, <laughs> and then the other one, which is a little more. Fanny or fun fun is about um, two physicists who are uh, attempting to uh, rediscover their love by opening up a hole into another dimension through a high speed collider. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, cool. Yeah, well, you gotta get busy. That's what I'm supposed to be doing right now. <laughs> um, I'm well, just this out. well, I'll let you get to it. I want to thank you for for uh, for joining us if you want to uh, uh, find advantageous like I said it's available on streaming on Netflix right now uh, is there is there going to be a DVD or blu-ray release uh, anytime soon yes we should be talking to someone right now about that but um yes it is also available if you don't have Netflix or if you're in a country that doesn't have Netflix um, there are a few of those countries and um, it's it's available on like iTunes and voodoo right now also and you know so that's available for rent or purchase. And um, it's also still playing in San Francisco and New York um, until I think Thursday. Great. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. You can follow her on Twitter at, uh, was that Pong Vantages? Is that yes. right? Yes, that's right. And uh, uh, thank you for watching Hard Knock Life. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Perspective, watch it on your screen, hit play, so check. This, this is the hard knock life when I
not the chick of kind More like the people in the world Seeking perspectives with a different line The kids who share the interest together with a similar kind When they said John Glover for Spider-Man they didn't mind The activists, directors, comments and the lectures Fanboys, professional artists and professors Maybe a nerd who's just like you Talking about the things that you like too So I invite you to the end